Hey there, my name is Josh McEwen. If I haven't met you yet, welcome to our ABC online service. If you're looking for new ways to get plugged into ABC, we have tons of group opportunities, including CR, men's group, women's group, but also two new groups that are coming up here pretty soon. Starting March 2nd is a find your people group, a chance for you to get to know new people um, on Wednesdays, again, starting March 2nd. And then an additional group that we're starting up is New Year, New Friends. That will be starting February 27th. If you're a young family and would like to come but need childcare, that is available by reservation. So please check that out. You can find more information on all those groups on our website at abcchurch.org. As some of you know, I'm the youth director here at ABC. And in this last weekend, we had the opportunity to take 14 people down to LA to do a service experience. And I don't know about you, but like when we look at service experiences, the first thing that comes to mind is how can we change the culture down there? Our goal wasn't necessarily that though. Our goal was to get the experience, make connections, and actually give our students something new to think about when it comes to the homeless crisis in LA. So we partnered with Powerhouse Church in Watts and Union Rescue Mission on Skid Row to give our students an immersed experience with indigenous workers that are truly light workers making a difference in their communities. The outcome of the trip was incredible. The idea that our students can actually be in a residential um, area like Union Rescue Mission where they're interacting with the homeless population, getting to know stories, and truly hearing transformational lives by the work of Jesus was powerful and gave our students a new perspective of how the gospel is impacting dark communities. Overall, we're planning to do even more service trips as the year continues and into upcoming years. And if something uh, kind of sparks in you as you hear that we're doing these trips, we still need help. We want to continue to build more of a missions culture here in our youth ministry and get people excited that missions is still worth it and missions is so much fun. Our students loved it and if you want more information on what we're doing in youth with missions, come chat with us and I'd gladly give you some more information. To wrap up, uh, excited that you guys are joining us for the online service. I hope you enjoy the rest of your Sunday. Thanks so much. Peace. Well, hey, thanks for watching uh, again this morning. We are so glad that we can bring um, our church to you in some way through this format. Uh, and we just hope that this is not a last step for you in engaging with us. We would love to see you on a Sunday morning soon. We have all kinds of options uh, that seem to cover um, a lot of different comfort levels in, in every way. So we'd love to see you on Sunday morning at some point soon. We're in a series through the book of Matthew and we're in Matthew chapter three, seven through 12 today. Um, before we do, I, I remember a time, um, multiple times, where we like to take our kids down to Disneyland every couple of years. Um, and there's this one thing that I notice uh, more than once. So we go down to Disneyland, we like to stay a night or two if we can, somewhere around the park. There's this hotel that we love to stay at up on the corner of Harbor and Ball down there in Anaheim, maybe a quarter mile to the entrance of the park. And so what'll happen is we'll walk down South Harbor Boulevard in the morning and we go past Panera, past McDonald's, and then we'll get to the IHOP right next to the walkway uh, into the entrance to the park. And right there in front of the IHOP, there is this guy and you hear him before you see him. But eventually you get up close to him within eye shot and you see this guy and he's standing on a plastic crate and he's got a megaphone and he's yelling and he seems mad and crazy and sad all at the same time. And he's thrusting a sign up and down into the air that reads what single six letter word? It reads repent. Of all the offensive words in the Bible, maybe the most offensive and insensitive craziest sounding and curious word of all, repent. Now, we all have our opinions about this guy, right? And don't get me wrong, I can probably think of 500 forms of evangelism that are more effective than this. But what strikes me and makes me almost laugh every time I get into a situation like that, with this guy specifically, I get there in that situation and I just kind of think to myself, I actually completely agree with what he's saying. Like everything he's saying is completely true. And I get that maybe is unpopular, especially in my age group, but I just think, okay, everything he's saying is actually true. I mean, his content is spot on. He's just, he's rattling off verse after verse and he's not even taking them out of context. 
He's, he's preaching the same kind of judgment, the same kind of repentance, the same heaven and hell, the same way, truth, and life that, that John and that Peter and Paul and Jesus himself preached all throughout the New Testament. So it's almost comedic. Like I find myself laughing inside how much I actually agree with what the crazy guy is saying. And then I just have this other thought. I think what a telling moment this is. Like what a fitting moment. Here we are, just this, this scene that we're acting out, this mass of people just standing at the crosswalk, just trying to get, waiting for the light to turn green, waiting for the little red hand to turn into the little walkie guy, just to go across the street, get into the happiest place on earth because there's money to be spent, there's fun to be had. We're just trying to spend as much as we can to have a little moment of fun in this brief time. But we're forced, at least for a moment, to share a street corner with this crazy guy who's shouting at the top of his lungs what sounds to most people like complete nonsense. And everybody else is just keeping their head down, just walking forward, just cringing inside and just thinking, okay, just look ahead, just walk forward. Maybe if we don't look at him, he'll just go away. And now obviously I don't stand on plastic crates and I don't hold up repentant signs and shout into bullhorns. But sometimes I just think that's what it feels like, honestly, to be a Christian in 2022, let alone be a pastor. Sometimes I feel a little bit more like the crazy guy than I do feel like the crowd. And maybe you feel that way too. That's just an extremely exaggerated example where the contrast is so clear that it's almost funny. But maybe you see that contrast more often than not all around you. And I kind of hope that you do as you just try to hold to a biblical view of something, like just an orthodox biblical view of the hardest things in life, like judgment, like repentance, like heaven and hell. And sometimes you just feel like, okay, here's the reality. If the Bible is true, and I think that it is, here, here's what I understand to be the reality about this. Okay, we're not gonna live forever. Okay, heaven is real, hell is real, eternal punishment is real. Everybody dies, nobody lives forever, this is how it is. So you believe that, but it's like everybody else around you is just walking forward, keeping their heads and their eyes down, just waiting for the little red hand to turn into the little walking sign so they can just cross the street because there's money to be spent and there's fun to be had in our brief moment on earth. And they just think if we just keep moving forward, keep our heads down, and if we just don't look at the reality, maybe it'll just go away. And I get it. I get it because lots of times I don't want to look at the reality either. And I spend a lot of my life justifying why I don't talk enough about it or why I don't tell enough people about it. And I say, well, you know, this and this and that. And, oh, you know, I'll have time later, whatever it is. I, I get it. I really do. Even in church, we don't talk very much about it. And, and maybe that's because the previous generation talked too much about it. I don't know. But I do know if there's one thing I've struggled with most in my faith, it's this idea of God's punishment. This idea that he would set this whole system and story in motion. This epic thing from creation to fall to gospel to future glory. And it's this beautiful, powerful story, but only for some of us. Like, oh, like some of us would be really happy in heaven at the end of the day after this whole incredible drama is played out. There's going to be a lot of happy people in heaven, I believe. But at the same time, there's going to be multitudes of people experiencing eternal conscious punishment in hell for their sin. I just think, why, why would God do that? Like, it, could there have been a different way he could stack the deck? Is, is it really going to be worth it? Is the glory of some worth the pain and the destruction of the others? Those are my thoughts. Those are my deepest doubts and my deepest questions. And I don't have answers to those questions, honestly. But I find myself so convicted by these words today. Francis Chan wrote a book called Erasing Hell, and he said this, It's incredibly arrogant to pick and choose which incomprehensible truths we embrace. No one wants to ditch God's plan of redemption, even though it doesn't make sense to us. Neither should we erase God's revealed plan of punishment because it doesn't sit well with us. As soon as we do this, we're putting God's actions in submission to our own reasoning, which is a ridiculous thing for the clay to do. I just say all of that to get into this short message of John the Baptist today. Ultimately, it's a twofold message about what Jesus came to do. And one of those things I love, and the other thing, I'm growing in faith. So Matthew 3, 7 through 12. 
John the Baptist here. So when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, you brood of vipers who warned you to flee from the wrath to come, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. And don't presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the ax is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but the chaff he'll burn with unquenchable fire. Would you just pray with me for a moment before we move on? Father, this is a passage that requires immense faith for me personally. And I'm sure that I'm not alone in that. When I read words like unquenchable fire, God, that's a struggle for me. And I just want to admit, confess, and right now repent of the way that I try to put my standards of justice on you the way that I try to impose what I think is good, what I think would be the right way to do, what I understand of mercy, and I try to impose that on the God of the universe. God, that's, frankly, I'm embarrassed that I do that. I'm sorry that I do that. God, would you strengthen my faith in you today as, as we wrestle uh, with something hard together. In your name, amen. Before we really move on, let's kind of get our bearings of where we're at, uh, who's, John, who, who's John talking to here. So who are the Pharisees and Sadducees? It starts with that in the first line. Start with the Pharisees. The two groups were similar, but also completely different. So the Pharisees, they were a very exclusive group, but they were also very public. In larger cities, especially like Jerusalem, they made a point of being noticed. Matthew 23 tells us that. Uh, we don't know for sure, but they probably developed out of a former Jewish uh, group called the Hasidim. That meant pious ones or saints. They came into being during the second century before Christ during the intertestamental time is the time between the Old Testament and the New Testament. So Palestine had been under Greek rule for many years. And you've heard of this in history. Jewish patriots under the leadership of Judas Maccabeus revolted when Antiochus Epiphanes tried to force pagan culture and religion onto the Jews. There was this story. He actually one time sacrificed a pig on the temple altar, and he forced it down the throats of the Jewish priests, a double abomination. So the Hasidim were among the strongest supporters of the revolt until its leaders became really worldly and politicized. So then from that fallout, very likely were born the Pharisees, ultra conservative, ultra purist, ultra protective, exclusive, and elite. Admission to this group was by a strict one-year probation where the applicant had to prove their ability to follow ritual law. They would separate themselves from all Gentiles and sinners, and everybody else was sinners. You say, who's sinners? Everybody. See, they even judged the common Jewish people. They would wash themselves as soon as they left anywhere. They were like hand sanitizer people before it was cool, but they weren't like washing off germs after the market and the temple. They were washing off sinfulness of the people around them. They'd wash themselves whenever they left anywhere. They believed that they alone were the true Israel. One commentator said it this way so well, that they considered themselves to be super spiritual, but their spirituality was entirely external, consisting of the pursuit of meticulous observance of a multitude of religious rituals and taboos, most of which they and various other religious leaders had devised over the previous several centuries as supplements to the law of Moses. They were... They were, they were doing everything they could to follow these laws that weren't even laws of Moses. They had added them in over the centuries. What do you need to know about the Pharisees? You need to know that their single loyalty was to themselves, to their traditions, to their influence, and their prestige. Now, who are the Sadducees? Similar but different. They were the other extreme, not conservative. They were ultra-liberals. They didn't care about Greek culture with its emphasis on philosophy and intellectualism, but they really liked the pragmatic, practical, down-to-business Romans. So they claimed loyalty to the law of Moses, just like the Pharisees did, but they hated the legalistic traditions of the Pharisees. But it's interesting how the New Testament considers both parties 
all similar enough to, to often use the terms interchangeably. They use Sadducee, Pharisee, even chief priest, scribe. A lot of times when the New Testament uses one of those, they're almost doing a blanket over a lot of those groups. So the Sadducees, they didn't care much about religion. They denied the existence of angels, the resurrection, most things supernatural. That means that they were entirely naturalist. They lived for the present, for the flesh. And they would exploit Jews and Gentiles alike in order for them to get ahead. They were a smaller group than the Pharisees. They were extremely wealthy. Under the leadership of Annas, they ran the temple franchises, which if you remember, Jesus was not a fan of. The money exchanging, the sale of sacrificial animals to people who couldn't even afford it. Because of their wealth, their temple racketeering, their Roman affiliation, they were much less popular than the Pharisees were with their fellow Jews. What do you walk away with from from both of these, these parties? Remember that the groups were completely different, In fact, the only thing they had in common was their hatred of Jesus. But because of that, their basic problem and their need was exactly the same. They needed to repent. They needed to to lay before God with a broken and contrite heart because they had both gotten it all wrong in completely different ways, but they had gotten it all wrong. So to them, John the Baptist, he says, you brood of vipers. Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Listen to what he says. Bear fruit in keeping with repentance. He's saying, who warned you guys? I know this isn't a genuine thing. You guys wanting to come and be baptized for repentance, just like these other honest, genuine Jews. I know that's not you guys. What are you doing here? And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, well, we've got Abraham as our father. We get, we, we're clean and we're holy and we're righteous because of Abraham. And he says to them, don't even presume to say, we have Abraham as our father. I tell you, God is able to raise from these stones children for Abraham. That doesn't matter as much as you think it does. Even now the ax is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that doesn't bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. You see what he does here? He's saying, you think it's a big deal that Abraham's your father, but he even rebukes that in a stronger way in that first line. He says, you brood of vipers. The word brood there can also mean offspring. And so in this really piercing way, John is saying, you think you're offspring of Abraham. You think that's who you are. I'm actually saying you're not offspring of Abraham. You're the offspring of snakes, more specifically the snake, the original serpent. You're not a child of Abraham. You guys are children of the devil. Wow. John says some very piercing things to these leaders who we don't know why they were there, why they wanted to get baptism. Maybe it was just for show. I don't know. Maybe they thought that Jesus was going to have some some power and some pull in the empire, so they wanted to be on his good side. We don't know. But John says some very piercing things to the leaders. But what do we pull from that? What do we pull? Ultimately, John's saying, my baptism is a baptism of repentance. So this was a custom, and and it was beginning to get more and more common for the Jewish people. They wanted to be washed. Uh, They wanted to make sure that they were clean and ready in preparation for the Messiah. So baptism was this sign of repentance and cleansing. So we just have to ask, what is repentance? And is is this for us in the same way? What is repentance? Well, really basically, it's to change one's mind or purpose. And you could stop right there, and let's just admit that's a really hard thing for us to do. Just let alone just to change our minds. That's a hard thing for us to do. And and oftentimes we feel like embarrassed when we have to do that. It's like, it's our joke in my, uh, in in our marriage between me and Nikki. I mean, I'm constantly changing my mind on things. Like when the Air, when Apple AirPods came out, I thought they were just the silliest thing in the whole, I was like, you're gonna pay how much money? Like just to get rid of of the wires? That's ridiculous. And Nikki was like, yeah, it is ridiculous. And literally like six months later, I just woke up one day and I'm just like, I need AirPods. <laughs> I don't know how to explain it. I just need them. And now today, I can't imagine having wires on my AirPods still. Like I just, I flip on stuff all the time and Nikki constantly gives me a hard time for it. But it's hard for people, for real things, like deep, significant things to change our minds on things. It's kind of embarrassing. It humbles you a little bit because you're ultimately saying, I was wrong about that thing. That thing that I, I thought or I believed now I'm looking at that and I'm saying I was wrong. Well, that's a central part of repentance. I love the way that Eric Sauer split this apart. There's three points uh, in his definition of repentance. Let me walk through those. 
Number one, repentance in the understanding, that means that you have knowledge of sin. Just means that you have knowledge of your sin. This is David in Psalm 51 when he says, I know my transgressions. My sin is ever before me. I know it. This is just admitting it. So every recovery group you ever see, it's, it just starts there. It, admitting it is the first step. You're not gonna go anywhere until you know cognitively, this is a problem. I know that I have sinned, but it doesn't stop there. Number two, repentance in the feelings. That means you experience pain and grief. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. David goes on. There's, there's a feeling, there's a visceral reaction when you experience true repentance. And we all know the difference between sadness because you got caught and sadness because you actually inflicted pain on another human being or you offended God himself. We know the difference between those two things. I see it in my kids all the time. You know, you're forcing them to say sorry and they say sorry. And like, say sorry for what? And they're like, sorry, I hit you. And like, you don't, you don't feel it, you don't know. But then there's other times where they're, you, you tell this broken, contrite spirit within them. They are so sad that they inflicted pain on their sister. Number two is the feelings. But number three, there's repentance of the will. And that means that you have a change of mind. You have a change of direction. Something changes here. This is David saying, restore to me the joy of your salvation. And then I'm gonna change. I'm gonna teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. Another way to remember that is just simply head, heart, and hands, right? This goes for all areas of belief, but, but especially repentance. To actually grasp it, to really uh, truly believe something demands this progression from your head to your heart to your hands. Your head, your knowledge of something to your heart. You feel it, you experience it at a gut level in your heart of hearts, down to your hands. Well, this is gonna change how I do things. I'm changing direction, I'm turning here. It's wild to think just how, how out there repentance is for our world. I mean, even to regret something feels like a cardinal sin in our culture. You just ask anybody in their 20s, their 30s, whatever, like, oh man, this experience, do you regret it at all? This relationship, do you regret it at all? And it's just like, it's like scripted for us already. It's like, no, I don't regret it. I just, I was living into my truth and it manifested who I am today. There's zero regrets. It'd be sinful to, re and I'm just like, no, man, I, I have so many regrets. Gosh, I've said things that break my heart. I've done, I've sinned against people and I've done things and I've, I've used my words to cut people deep. Like I, I have deep regrets in my life. I think to the point where a Christian's ability to repent, like to feel deep remorse and regret and just own that with humility and honesty, our ability to do that might be one of the most culturally unique things about us if we would step into that. So that's John's baptism, it's repentance. But that's not even really the point of the passage. John goes on and he says, he, so that's how I'm gonna baptize, but he, Jesus, will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. John says, I'm gonna baptize you guys for repentance. It's this Jewish thing, we're all familiar with it. We're cleansing and in, in, in awaiting the Messiah. But he's saying there's, there's someone else coming and he's gonna baptize in an entirely different way. And for many years, I look at this passage and, and honestly, I breeze through it because it sounds scary and it sounds confusing. So he's gonna baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire. What does that mean? So there's two ways that Jesus is baptizing and will baptize. Number one, he's coming to baptize with the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? It ultimately means that Jesus came to save. Jesus came to save. To be baptized with the Holy Spirit, that means that you are welcomed into the family of God. It's the thing that happens when you, by the Spirit's leadership, by his awakening your dead heart to new life, he calls you into the family of God, he cleanses you, and he regenerates you, he gives you new life. 
This is what happens for a Christian at the moment of salvation. You are baptized technically with the Holy Spirit in that moment. This is why Paul says it in 1 Corinthians 12, 13. He says, in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. Jews or Greeks, slaves or free. And we were all made to drink of one spirit. So Jesus came to baptize with the Holy Spirit it means he came to save. He came to give you this entrance point into the family of God by which you would be cleaned and purified and regenerated, given new life. That's beautiful. That's exciting. That's amazing. And I love that. But that's not it. And the second one is hard for me. He came to baptize with fire. What does that mean? To give us a picture, John lays out this quick agricultural illustration of clearing a threshing floor. And, and I'm no farmer, but I did some digging. And so learned that a farmer would mark out a space where ultimately they would come and they would dump their harvest in order to separate the good wheat from the worthless chaff. So then on a windy day, they would take their winnowing fork, imagine this big kind of more spacious rake, and they would scoop up some wheat and they would just toss it up into the air, up and down, up and down. And now the good wheat is heavy, so it would fall back down to the ground, onto the threshing floor. But the chaff that's worthless, it would blow away in the wind. See, so then the farmer would take the wheat back into the barn. But the chaff that blew away, he would burn. He would destroy it. Here's what we see. Is that Jesus came to perform both of these functions salvation and judgment. Bringing the wheat back into the barn under his loving protection, under his care, in his comfort, in his presence, in his love, but burning the chaff that blew in the wind. Jesus came to do both and I struggle with that, honestly. It's hard to reconcile that for me and I don't think I'm alone in that. He came to, to, he came to save. And I'm like, yes, that's beautiful. Oh, it's gracious. That's the, G yeah, I like it, man. And sometimes we're tempted to kind of design this idea of Jesus, this idea of, of God and his world in the way that, that seems right to us, that seems merciful, that seems good, that seems just. And then I think, oh, he's gonna burn the chaff with unquenchable fire, with judgment. And I just think, what do we do with all of that? What do we do with a hard truth? Ultimately, I see two things here. There's a barn and there's a fire. Like, wh like what do you do? What do you feel? What do you think after, after you read this passage? I just see there's two things. There's a barn and there's a fire. And neither exists without the other. And for you and me, these are the only two choices in life, for eternity, for everybody in the world, for everybody around us. These are the two choices. There's a barn and there's a fire. And frankly, and I'm preaching to myself here, it doesn't matter how that sits with me. It doesn't matter how I, I feel about that. It doesn't matter that so often, if I'm honest, I'm tempted to apologize for God. I'm tempted to feel embarrassed by this, this way that he set it up. I'm tempted to talk less about his more difficult attributes to make room for his more palatable ones. He doesn't have to fit in my standards of justice. He doesn't have to appeal to my idea of goodness and love and what I think that should look like. I know that he is compassionate and he is just. He's loving and he's holy. He's forgiving and he's wrathful. He's more terrifyingly holy and mysterious than I will ever comprehend. But... I've tasted enough to know that he is good. So here's what I know. Here's what I know. That those who do not put their faith in Jesus for the forgiveness of their sins will experience eternal conscious punishment in a literal place called hell. But here's what I also know that right now, the barn doors are wide open. The doors are wide open. They won't always be. There's gonna come a day when Jesus says it's time. It's time to judge and that's gonna be it. 
But right now, in this life, in this moment, until Jesus says otherwise, that barn is wide open and everybody is invited in into the love of the Father, into the covering of his Son, into his protection from the fire, his shelter from the wind. So when the storms come, you're not blown away. And when the fire of judgment comes, you're gonna be safe under his loving protection, under his cover, under his shelter in this good barn, in his forgiveness, his comfort, his presence, in his love. And when that day comes and he says, it's time, it's time to judge, please hear me. It's not gonna be because he hates the chaff and he wants to see him burn. No, he longs that everybody would come to him, would repent, would receive salvation and forgiveness. He wants to gather everybody up and bring them into the barn, but so many will just refuse. And there's gonna come a day when there's a fire of judgment and that's not because he hates the chaff, it's because he loves the wheat. And so he has to close the doors because there's going to be a fire and he has to protect the wheat. And so he's going to close the doors. We're going to be safe. We're going to be held in his good, perfect hands. And we're going to be protected in his love and in his presence and in his comfort. Here's all I'm saying. What if we just stopped worrying so much about looking like the crazy guy in front of the IHOP, right? Megaphone, sign. What if we just stopped worrying so much about looking like the crazy guy or sounding like the crazy guy? We just, we realize just how urgent this is, but maybe it looks less like a sign and a bullhorn and more like a list of names in a prayer closet. Maybe it looks less like shouting and yelling and anger. And maybe it looks more like pleading and begging with your friends and your family with a broken and contrite spirit. Not out of judgment, but just out of love. Maybe less tiptoeing around people's feelings and more actually caring about people's eternal destinies. I just wanna close with this one quote. Jordan Peterson, I don't think he's a Christian, But interesting enough, he likes to talk about faith and spirituality and heaven and hell a lot. And I just think he says it really well. In an interview, he just said, you tell people you love how to avoid the road to hell. And you don't do that because you're shaking your finger at them or because you're a moral authority. You do it because you don't want them to burn. I think there's still too much of the moral authority in the church and not enough of the love that helps people actually avoid the fire. Let me pray. Father, I I thank you for these moments that we've shared. I thank you for your word. And I honestly wanna be in a spot of deep, honest gratitude for the truth that you've given us for the way that that grounds us in a, in a world and in a culture that's constantly just blowing in the wind, constantly looking for some source of hope and faith to hold on to uh, when, when truth is relative and, and, uh, and it seems like nothing matters and w- whatever it is. And it seems like there's no right or wrong. God, I thank you for the firm ground of your truth. Again, Lord, I repent, I confess Uh, The times when I feel tempted to not talk about your your hard truths, to not talk about your more difficult uh, attributes in my perspective, to to just want to focus on the more palatable ones, the ones that are just maybe more attractive to the onlooking world or more compelling to people who will listen to our sermons. God, I'm sorry. Forgive me for that. Today, Lord, would you inspire us would you just encourage us to be urgent, to be people who, who look at the reality, who are not just constantly waiting for the little red hand to turn into the walking sign so we can just be on our way and spend our money and have our fun. But Lord, looking at the reality, life is short, it's not promised, heaven is real, hell is real. God, would we live in light of, of impending eternity like that? God, I thank you for your word and I thank you that at the end of the day, Lord, you are a good and loving Father that longs that every, everybody would come into that barn, would step through those wide open doors while there is time, and we would be protected and covered and loved in your presence and in your comfort. God, you are good. You are more merciful than I can comprehend. You are more gracious than I understand. 
I believe that, Lord. We love you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.